the Black Forest to Thornton, where we've got uh, Dr. Yadira Caravero, Yadira Caravero, and uh, we happen to have uh, two special people, Will and Dr. Caravero, who uh, have both been to the White House this summer, I believe. Uh, Dr. Caravello was recognized as a climate change champion for the work that she's done for a long time, uh, starting for back when she was in New Mexico in her residency. And I don't know if people in their residency get as involved as it sounds like you've got, you know, about things outside of the bubble of, of uh, completing their work, but uh, became an activist right away in terms of trying to make conditions better for the people she was working with and recognizing things that I, as somebody who lived in New Mexico for a time, uh, was not aware of the pollution issues that it sounds like you found out about down there that were affecting your patients. So here's somebody who's been a great champion on behalf of her patients and all Coloradans in terms of looking at the health effects that climate change has in a very real way, Dr. Yadira Caravelli. everybody for being here. So um, I think a, a question that I often get is why why is a doctor and a pediatrician of all doctors talking about climate change? Um, why, why would a doctor care? Um, and I think that really um, when we talk about climate deniers and when we talk about the work that we have to do to to bring awareness to, to the fact that climate change is here and now and not something that's going to be coming in 20 years. Um, a great way to, to really frame that discussion is on um, issues of health. Um, you know, we can show a lot of pictures of cute polar bears and, and melting ice caps and um, that's not going to do it for some people, honestly. But when you frame it in, in terms of heat strokes and um, elderly people who, you know, don't have air conditioning and end up in the hospital or children with asthma attacks, um, that's something that kind of brings it more to, to um, the forefront for, for a lot of people. Um, to, for me, you know, I, I was... Uh, I've always been kind of interested in advocacy as, as a part of medicine um, and through, throughout residency was pretty involved in, um, you know, in things that you would, you would imagine a doctor being involved in, you know, making sure that the, the, the state budget uh, protected the hospital, making sure that there was uh, funding for Medicaid. Um, I was part of a resident union that, you know, protected doctor work hours so that uh, we didn't uh, cause injury due to fatigue. Um, but really, what, what really started to strike me as I went throughout residency was, uh, you know, Albuquerque, for those of you who haven't been there, is in a little bit of a bowl. It, the mountains there are on the east side instead of the west, but then it's got some volcanoes on the other um, side of town. And much like Denver, um, which is in a little bit of a bowl, and where growing up in the uh, suburbs, I could see the, the cloud of smog kind of resting over Denver. When I drove into work in Albuquerque, I could see that, that cloud of smog once again, and, really it started to give me a pretty good idea of how busy I was going to be that day in the emergency room. Um, it seemed that the hotter that it got, which in Albuquerque it can get pretty hot, the thicker that smog was, the longer it stayed around, and the more kids I saw with trouble breathing. So that's really when um, uh, I started to get interested in, in climate change and how it affected health. Um, ended up uh, involved with a, a group called uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and through them have done some some work in trying to bring awareness to how climate change affects everybody's health. Um, and, and through that group ended up um, having the honor of go, going to the White House a couple of times to speak to uh, members of the Obama administration about um, carbon emission standards for uh, carbon burning uh, power plants and, and really its effects on children's health. So I think millions of people um, across the United States suffer from um, diseases such, of as, such as asthma. And, um, and really when you think about health, um, you, you don't want to think about people being unable to breathe. Um, so the Union for Concerned Scientists has kind of been trying to shape a, a conversation around things like uh, health effects so that we can kind of uh, address climate change in a way that more people will understand or care about. They've done a lot of, uh, you know, kind of number crunching around the health effects of climate change, um, particularly around uh, ozone pollution. Um, and, and really the fact that as the days get hotter, as summers get hotter, the, the uh, work that we've done around reducing carbon emissions from power plants, from cars, um, uh, and, and other sources is going to be done away with by the fact that the, the climate is getting hotter and therefore we're going to be um, facing more ozone, ozone pollution. Um, through the kind of numbers that they've looked at, 
um, just nine years from now, well, less than nine years from now, that's when the study was done. In 2020, they estimate that the United States is going to spend about $5.4 billion um, because of the effects of ozone on um, ozone pollution on health. Um, really, you know, what we think about in terms of ozone affecting respiratory illnesses um, is causing asthma attacks, shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, and by 2050, um, just the, the effects of, of increased ozone on those types of illnesses are probably going to lead to an additional 11.8 million occurrences. Um, it's estimated that that will lead to about 944,000 missed, missed days of school by 2020 and about 4.1 million additional missed days of school by 2050. As you guys know, for every kid that misses school, there's a parent that has to stay at home with them. Um, higher ozone pollutions are also going to affect seniors. Um, estimates are that about 3,700 more seniors um, and that about 1,400 uh, more infants are going to be hospitalized because of respiratory illnesses by 2020 and about 24,000 uh, seniors by, an annually by 2050. Um, so really, you know, this is something that's going to affect everybody. Uh, in, in my practice, which uh, we see a lot more allergy and asthma than I think a lot of other practices do who are associated with an allergy practice. But I'd say about a third to half of the kids that I see on a day-to-day -day basis have had asthma. And um, just yesterday when I was at work, I had three different kids who came in grunting and, um, and really working hard for breath and had to do a few uh, nebulizer treatments. Had to think about, do I need to start oxygen on these kids? And you know, it's something that I'm seeing every day and that I want people to be aware of. Um, so that they see that, that climate change is here and now. Um, so what is ozone? You know, usually when we think of ozone, we think of the, the level in the atmosphere that we made a hole in and that we've been repairing in the last few decades, but really what I'm talking about is ground level um, pollution. So when we think about smog, the majority of that is, um, is what we call ground level ozone. And that's made up of uh, chemicals that we release into the air reacting with heat and sunlight to form this substance. Um, so heat and temperature are a huge driver in this kind of chemical equation. And the hotter it is, the more those uh, nitrous oxides and volatile organic compounds that we create when we drive to school and work, uh, when the uh, power plants uh, burn coal, um, the more of those are going to be turned into, um, into ground level ozone, the hotter that it gets. Um, we've made huge strides, I think, um, with the Clean Air Act um, and the standards that the EPA have, has put into, um, into effect. There's been huge reductions in the number of pollutants that we're putting into the air. Um, um, enough so that it's estimated that we've been saving about 3,700 lives a year because of the reductions that we've made. But uh, really what we've been looking at is a, a, what we're calling the climate penalty. Um, where, where uh, it's expected that these strides that we've made in the last few decades are going to be done away with almost completely um, by the fact that, <clears throat> that we're letting the world get up warmer. Uh, in the last century, the, the temperature increased about 2 degrees Fahrenheit. It's expected that it's going to um, increase by that much probably in the next couple of decades, and if we do nothing to mitigate how much carbon we're putting into the atmosphere, it might increase by 7 to 11 degrees by the end of next century. So it's something that we really need to do something to mitigate our emissions now because carbon stays in the um, atmosphere for a long time, creates increased warmth for a long time, and therefore creates increased ozone levels for a long time. Um, so the, the, the effects that ozone has on health is it doesn't necessarily cause asthma. Um, asthma is you know, something that you're predisposed to, and for some reason it's been increasing in the last uh, few decades for reasons that we really don't know. But what we do know is that ozone creates uh, increased inflammation in your nose, your lungs, um, makes you cry, uh, make, gives you a burning or stinging sensation in your nose, and then it clamps up your, um, your airways. Um, and that's something that I see every day uh, at work. You know, I think we all um, are familiar with driving down the highway and seeing those giant signs that say, you know, red, red, uh, air level or red air zone tomorrow, uh, don't run your lawnmower, try not to, to drive, but really what we should be telling people is don't go outside. Um, it's hard in, in the pediatric population when we're trying to get kids to get, you know, we're trying to combat an obesity epidemic as well, um, trying to tell kids go outside, 
play, run, um, but only do it if the weatherman says that it's okay. Um, it, especially because air pollution tends to have a, a greater effect on children than it does on adults. They are, they're smaller, their lungs are still developing, and so any exposure to chemicals or toxins in the air tends to stick around for life. You know, it may predispose them to conditions that they're going to have to deal with forever. Um, because they're smaller, they breathe faster, and so the exposure to these chemicals ends up being much higher than it would be in you or I, because more of it gets in there. Um, and they tend to be outside more, more than we are. Um, and so really it's something that I've had to approach with a lot of the, uh, the families in my practice to say, you know, it, you're, you're going to think that it's strange that I'm bringing up climate change as a doctor, but it's unfortunately going to be part of our everyday lives as we start to think about the, the air that we breathe in. Um, so I think that, you know, through the, the, um, the conversations that I've been having since, since being at the White House and now a, uh, a group that we're forming of healthcare professionals who are interested in climate change because one doesn't really exist, at, um, up, didn't really exist up until now, um, my focus is going to be on really trying to change the conversation so that uh, people you know, can't deny that the days are getting hotter and they can't deny when they see a kid who's, who's struggling for breath. Um, and so uh, really, um, you know, when we talk about climate change and we think about forest fires and, and its um, effects on asthma and we think about um, uh, droughts and heat, um, heat strokes and, uh, and um, and kind of also a lot of the other effects that we, we tend to see and that are uh, highlighted much more in media, we need to be uh, starting a conversation about how it's affecting our health. So, thank you very much.